but thank you everyone for coming. This downtown um, event has been organized by the Sean Greenwood Working Group. I would just like to introduce briefly what's the work of the Sean Greenwood Working Group, who we are and why we actually decided the task of organizing uh, this tour, and so why we want to bring uh, the issue of political prisoners up in Ithaca. So there is a lot of uh, literature just to, for you to get right there, and so I want to read a bit of it. This is like the, the Shangri-Wood uh, Declaration that I think explains it and summarizes very well what the aims of our group are. So the problems that the Shangri Working Group aims to address include, but not limited to, police brutality and profiling, recidivism, poverty, racism, and how these factors work together to keep people oppressed. The issues in our communities will not be solved by increasing police presence but rather through larger political uh, and structural transformations. We believe that it's the work of we, the people, to question, investigate, and hold police accountable for murder or any other criminal acts when they happen in our community. To accept less of that is to be complacent with and supportive of the systemic and structural racism that exists. It also sends a clear message to communities of color, especially youth, that their lives do not matter. By addressing police misconduct, exposing the lies and demanding justice, we have the occasion to see the structural inequality and to organize for change with greater respect for and participation with the most essential community members, those who are most marginalized and targeted. As residents of Ithaca, New York, we ask the Ithaca Police Department to not kill on our behalf. So this summarizes very well what we want, what our goals are. And I want to be very clear because a lot of people um, labeled us as an anti-police group. And of course, we are not anti-police. But what we, our aim is, is that we are happy to take the risk of being labeled as anti-police. If that is what it takes or the price to pay to gain the respect and the, and the trust of the people that are really oppressed in our community. And our idea is that the larger structural transformation, the more radical structural transformation I was referring to, is for us the subversion of the current power structure. And the police represents part of that power structure. So one of the really basic principles of politics is that it's very hard to actually aim to subvert the power structure. It's very hard to do it with the consent of the people who are in power. So we're not surprised a lot of people, a lot of cops, a lot of police, even though we're not accusing them, would not be incredibly pleased of most of our activity. Um, so this addressed the first part. The second part is why uh, talking about political prisoners, and the answer, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm knowing most of your faces that you already know uh, why we want to talk about this, is because part, what made me the biggest part of the tragedy of the American democracy is the prison system. And part of the means that we need to achieve more larger and radical transformation is to change the imagination of people that the way in which America deals with crime is not the only way in which it could be dealt with. And so I want to, you know, I want to conclude this very short introduction with giving you one statistic. I'm assuming that you're already familiar with the fact that a quarter of the world's prisoner population is the American prisoner. But one other thing that hopefully we can address today and that really connects with political prisoners is the tragedy of solitary confinement. Um, and again, to me the shocking statistics, when I used to be active in Italy with comrades back home to try to fight um, the application of solitary confinement in, in political purposes, we, I mean, we would claim in Italy the total number of people under uh, and a hold on solitary confinement is 600. And we thought that the Italian government was incredibly criminal because 600 people tortured on a daily basis is too much. Do you know how many people are hold in solitary confinement in America? Just that it's in one single facility, Pelican Bay in California, there are 1,200. So t double the total number of people hold in solitary confinement in Italy. And the total number of people in solitary confinement in America is not clear, but it can go up to 80,000. Um, so I hope that you understand the, you know, the, the depth of the statement. And so 
uh, through hopefully through the testimony, Teresa, uh, we can understand really what, what that means and start working towards change. Thanks a lot. Hello, I'm James Ricks. I'm a member of the Sean Greenwood Working Group. This is my grandson, Hassan. He helped set up the chairs. I'm here tonight to uh, introduce Teresa Schultz, the daughter of Russell Maroon Schultz, a former Black Panther, a former member of the uh, Black Liberation Army. He's imprisoned. He's a soldier, a political prisoner, imprisoned in the bowels of the beast for more than three decades for his activism, his struggles against the paternalistic and racially biased system. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce Teresa Schultz, who will give you a much more comprehensive and a very personal account of, of Russell Maroon Schultz, our incarcerated brother and her father. Thank you. Give him a kiss. Give him a kiss. Thank you. Isn't that awesome? Oh, God, we got to acknowledge one of you for here. And I see that little one over there. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. <clears throat> this is where I want to be. We did a mad rush to make sure that we would be on time. So we're here, and it's good to see you. Um, I think what you, you should know first and foremost is that I am the eldest daughter of Russell Maroon Schultz. And Russell has a total of seven children, um, but there are three of us who are in the forefront of the campaign to make sure that he's released. Because with the issue of prison and having a loved one in prison, it can be very stressful, very much stressful. But I want you to know today that don't take that for not standing up straight and fighting against this present day prison system because it can be done. There are two million plus people in prison system, but we are bigger than this present day prison system. Russell Maroon Shokes did something. He had courage. Now it's a little girl. I didn't understand it. But now I realize how he protected my community, how he stood on the front lines to protect not only me. So he wasn't selfish about his freedom fighting. He looked out for everyone in the community, and when the police came into the area, West Philadelphia, where he lived, there was this brutal, brutal, formal police officer by the name of Frank Rizzo, who eventually became mayor, who was vicious and <clears throat> was determined to destroy the Philadelphia Black Panther chapter party. Um, he had acquired, uh, uh, accumulated a mass, mass assumption of, of um, weapons to fight against the Black Panthers in Philadelphia. He said he would get any weapons that he could as if he was fighting a war to fight the Black Panthers, and he did do that. Eventually, the United States Justice Department was brought in to investigate this police department, but as things go, nothing really came out of that. So Russell, along with other folks who thought that <clears throat> we should protect our own, took a stand. Now, some people get offended when they see black males with guns. It's not an offensive look. The look is to protect. The same way the police officers, he was saying we could be anti-police. Well, I am anti-police, especially if you're coming into a community and you're brutalizing people and you're shooting and killing innocent people and you could shoot someone and step over them and say, wrong nigga, I'm anti-police. I am. I'm anti anything that steps on poor people. And I'm just not saying people of color. I'm saying poor people in general. And right now, the government has a hand on us where not only are they stepping on us, they're crushing us. They're crushing poor people, and they don't care who you are. So in your heart and in your heart of beliefs, I say today, 
you must take a stand. You must not allow anything to go by you that you know in your heart that's not right. When you see something happen and you know it's wrong, take a stand. What we must remember is that Maroon right now presently is in 23-hour lockdown. I don't know if you've recently uh, gotten word that Maroon has been transferred to SCI Mal Hanoi. He's no longer at SCI Green where he's been at for more than 16 years. Him and Mamiya were in the same prison. Mamiya on death row and Russell Maroon Shokes on the other side of this death chamber camp because all of it to me means the same thing. It's not solitary confinement, it's a death camp. And that's what Maroon would title it, a death camp. But what Maroon would ask of you today, if he could be here in my place, and one day he will, we'll make sure we make this stop here. We'll come back and acknowledge everyone here, is that you never give up. Don't forget about your political prisoners. He didn't forget about us. And the first interview and the last interview that was done on Maroon at SCI Green Prison, it was fairly new when he first arrived at SCI Green and he didn't understand the solitary confinement. He was placed in the solitary, some people don't know this, but Maroon has liberated himself twice. Unfortunately, he was caught, but he, he got out twice. He's, he's, he's magnificent, he's a genius. And on his return, um, he did do some time in solitary confinement. He was punished for the last escape. He finished his time in solitary confinement. And people don't know this. He was out in population. He was out in population for a while, almost two years. He became the first black president. He was voted first black president of the Lifers Prison Approved Organization. And the warden personally came down to the prisoners and said, take it back. He will not be the first black president of this lifers organization. And the prisoners, mixed prisoners, Latino, black, white, said, no, we want him. And the warden said, no, if you don't take it back, there will be no lifers organization. Well, they didn't take it back. Now, this is the stand that they took. Now, see, here we are, what we consider out in the free world. Here, these are present-day, they're prisoners. And they know anything vile could happen to them, but they still took a stand, and they said, no. We'll go on a hunger strike, because we want him as our president. They went on a hunger strike. They eventually filed a lawsuit against the prison. And when all of that tension built up, you know, like that Occupy tension that built up, you know, and the government can't handle that type of resistance, they transferred Maroon to SCI Green. And that's why he's been in solitary confinement so long. Because whatever you can do, I don't care what level it's on, you may not be a person who can engage people and speak, because I'm certainly not. I have butterflies right now <laughs> squirming all over me, but I know that I have to do this for Maroon's freedom. So I don't care what level you're able to do, just you being here right now is taking a stand because you're educating yourself and you're becoming a know-how. Now, sometimes it doesn't look like we're getting anywhere, but you know we're getting somewhere when the government makes things harsher. When they continue to build prisons. And that's not just all harsh, that's profit. Prison is big business, real big business today. The worst part about it being big business, because we live in a, a capitalistic system, is that they're targeting our youth. See that little baby there? And these babies here? You're looking at kids that could be future prisoners just for no reason, just because it makes money. See, there's like a dollar sign placed on that kid's head. You just can't see it. So with that, um, you're noticing public schools are being closed. I don't know what's going on here in this state here, but in the state of Pennsylvania, this year our governor is going to close 25 to 30 schools. 
just to say $25 million, they are, uh, it, it's with $25 million we could save. The schools are draining us. The schools aren't draining us. The prison system, system is draining us. The governor is going to close the schools, but he's building one new prison, SCI Phoenix, and he's expanding SCI Greaterford, and he's going to include 400 beds for women. Now, what kind of government looks to lock up women? 400 beds at a cost of $681 million. So what is $25 million to keep public schools open? So with that, Maroon has really stepped up the pace in reference to saving our youth and making sure that we address this prison system. And any chance that I get to do it, I do it. And this is why Russell was a BLA member. <clears throat> Not only a Black Panther, Russell Maroon Shokes, early on before the Panther Party started the Black Unity Council in Philadelphia, and they eventually mer merged with the Panthers in 1969. But he started that Black Council, um, Black Unity Council because in his community, cops were just running in the community, beating people up, killing kids in front of their parents, and running amok in a black community. And so when you see uh, pictures of Black Panthers, um, not only just uh, um, taking advantage of their rights to carry guns, they were scared. <laughs> they had to protect themselves. They, it was war. So I'm here to tell you to stand up for freedom, to stand strong, to keep moving forward. We just got some awesome, awesome news that Maroon is now at SCI Mount Hanoi. The bad news about that, just for me, and I'm not saying this in a way to be negative, but that Mamiya, those of you who are familiar with Mamiya, he's at the same prison. So Maroon got a visit the other day because my sister and brother was there right away when we found out um, that uh, Maroon had been transferred. It was only due to my brother and this guy, Brett Grote, part of our legal team, just going to visit him, and they said, oh, he's not here. Can you imagine? We were terrified. We didn't know if he was dead or he was alive, if he was alive, because we know people die behind bars, and sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes they're pushed into it. As I told the audience last night, um, Daddy started the Human Rights Coalition group from behind bars. Our board members are all prison, prisoners. Um, we have a chapter in Pittsburgh, and the HRC chapter in Pittsburgh has doc, been document, documenting allegations of abuse for the last 10 years. So if there's a, a, a prisoner or someone you know that's in Pennsylvania and they're being abused, you can contact HRC, and we'll look into it and we'll investigate it. But um, with that um, organization that Maroon started from behind bars, We've been getting so many complaints in reference to the mentally ill who are stuck in solitary confinement. Uh, most of you know there aren't any facility, well, there are facilities, not as many as there used to be, not as many general assistance services as there used to be. So there are a lot of mentally ill who are just thrown inside a prison cell and they just left there. And we got a report recently where a mentally ill guy begged. I mean, he actually knew he wanted to kill himself somewhere in the back of his mind, and he needed his medication. But, of course, you don't get proper medical out here or proper insurance. So don't think they're going to give it to a prisoner. And he begged for his medicine, and he couldn't get it. He said, well, I want to kill myself. And the guards told him, go ahead. Let us help you. He said, no, I, you know, give me my medicine. They said, no, pick up that sheet tied around your neck. We'll show you. We'll help you. And the guy ended up killing himself. He was guided through the process at SCI Pittsburgh on how to kill himself. So when I think about that, I threw that in because Maroon has been in solitary confinement 20-plus years. And his mental status surprisingly, 
you know, I could be now dealing with a father who is approaching 70 years of age who could be mentally destroyed. I'm sitting there talking to some somebody that's changed mentally where he's unable to comprehend what I'm saying and I'm unable to comprehend what the hell he's saying. But fortunately, and I say this with great appreciation, that fortunately for people like you, for people like you who are conscious, who recognize injustice, who have stepped up to the plate, who have either written a letter or gone to a rally or called the prison, maroon wheels are constantly spinning. Those letters that you send prisoners, if you take the time out just once a day, when you get that email that says make a call to a prison, they don't look at it and say, oh, this is it's so overwhelming, not another phone call to a prison. Get, your, get up and make the call. Get up and write the letter. But more than anything, we have to make sure that we include our youth. See, that's what happened to my generation. Russell, and they, some do admit, Russell's generation, some of the Black Panthers admit that they did not properly pass down what they were doing. Russell was unfortunately unable to pass down his leadership because he was captured and he's been held all of these years. So uh, I, I'm constantly bombarded by Russell and his ideals. Okay, and I, I don't know if it's because he was unable to raise me and teach me how to be a leader, but, and his thinking, his process is that now, you and my daughter, you must help out. And I'm like, I, I like my little life. I like just going home and being with my two little dogs. No, 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 you got to go out there. You got to teach. You got to go out there. You got to save our youth. I said, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to deal with the youth. They just smoke blunts all over the place. and They have no respect. They don't even know how to go behind closed door and smoke their little blunts. <laughs> well, why don't you do something about that? Oh, what I'm going to do, he said, stop talking about it if you don't do something about it. So stop talking, sitting around if you don't do something about it. Well, he... He changed my mindset somewhat. So in the last year, I've had eight kids in my home. I became a foster parent. I did see my neighborhood running amok. But I was like a lot of others, and, <laughs> whatever. You know, I got to keep it moving. And my focus was on political prisoners and their freedom. But still, I had to walk by these youth every day and hear the foul language and the smoking of the blunts. And it wasn't until I came across this senior citizen, I was on my way to New York and I was catching public transportation this day. She said, I'm so afraid of these youth. And she was like unconsciously saying, I'm so afraid. I said, what did you say? And it, it really took me off guard because I, I'm approaching 50 years of age in a couple of months. And when I was a youth, I was so afraid of senior citizens. <laughs> I, you know, I can't even look at a senior citizen now that lives on a block I grew up with and think that um, I got any control over them. Not at all. When I was coming up, the senior citizens watch your every move. Your mother didn't even have to be home, and your mother had a record, like a document, verbal. You can look around the community and you see some of them looking out the window or some of them on the pit porch just shaking their head. I, I can remember one time being locked out the house and before my mother could get home, she knew that my brother had climbed up on the roof and went in the window. And I just thought then that, that sounded not normal to me, that a senior citizen would be afraid of a teenager in this day and time. So I trained and became a foster parent. And just last month, it, it was a year, February, and I've had eight kids. And you know my first thing was I don't want any teenagers. No teenagers. I want to get some young little kid this revolutionary start. And he's going to be a revolutionary, and he's going to take this world by storm. Of course, there were more teenagers in the system than any infants. My, my agency didn't even have any infants. 
So I was forced to take in a 17-year-old pregnant girl who had been addicted to wet, had a high-speed chase with the cops, stole the police car, and, uh, and she walked in my door saying, lady, you must be crazy. And I said, no, you must be crazy. She said, you know what I did? I said, I don't need to know. And I don't. I never questioned the kid's background. I don't need to know. Because all I know is that when you walk through this door, you get a second chance. Then you can take advantage of it, or you can continue to want to be a part of the street. Now, if you continue to want to be a part of the street, I will drag you out the front door, and I will squash you in that street. I'll make you a part of it. You want to be a part of it? I'll really show you how to be a part of it. So don't walk into my house thinking that you're going to run over me, because you're not. And we became best friends. We both cried when she had to leave. She was pregnant. She stayed clean the entire 28 days in my home. Didn't crave this drug, didn't want to go out. She felt the love. And I asked her one day, I said, you got to go out. I don't want to go out. I said, well, we're going to hear about uh, uh, Mamiya's new book with Dr. Mark Lamar Hill speaking. She's like, who is that? Who is Mamiya? So I said, you'll get that all when we get to the event. And she got there, and everyone said, oh, we heard about Teresa's foster daughter. You are family now. She was like, how do these people think they're my family? I don't even have real family. I said, no, for real. This is your extended family. And when she heard about Mamiya, she was so impressed. She had never heard of him. Pam Africa gave her some CDs to watch. She had never knew and was born and raised in Philadelphia that a bomb had been dropped on a family killing women and children. She had never heard of that. Of course, this happened before her time, but still, we did not teach her, as young as these kids are, about our past and this revolutionary past and our political prisoners. And that's where we need to work from here. Work with your youth and your community. They may be hard to approach. And guess what? You can't save them all. It's just not going to happen. I took in more 17-year-olds and a 13-year-old and a 3-month-old and a 6-year-old and a 2-year-old. And I just had to return a newborn that I had since he was 4 days old. And I kept him for 8 weeks until we started this tour. And the list goes on because there's still more kids to be saved. And that's what Maroon would say to you. And Maroon would say, not only do you save those kids, you save your political prisoners. Because Maroon is my hero, and he should be yours too. Maroon is a hero. Can you imagine being in a community and you feeling scared like that senior citizen and somebody step out in front and say, no, I got your back. I'm on the front lines right here. Nobody coming past this. No one's going to hurt you, not while we got this together. And that's what our political prisoners did. So I would tell you to take a stand. Never give up. Never, never give up. And free all of our political prisoners. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody here, and thanks, Teresa. Um, my name is Quincy Saul. I helped uh, edit, co-edited this book, Maroon the Implacable. Um, but I just want to back up before I start saying that and um, acknowledge Teresa is a, uh, not only a longtime advocate of her father for all, for all political prisoners, but as she told you, she's also like a Harriet Tubman of the foster care system. Um, and, and she can tell you the stories. It's crazy, you know, saving these kids from these situations. And that's part of what we're doing on this tour is connecting the specific struggle to free Russell Maroon Schultz with this whole system. Um, that, that has people locked up. I'm glad Mario mentioned when he... Uh, I just read an article about the Italian prison system, and uh, I think it's the largest prison, sy prison system in Europe. And anyone know how many people are in it? I think it's like 48,000, 49,000. There's more prisoners in the state of New York than in the largest prison population in Italy. So it's a crazy situation we got on our hands. People may be familiar with the quote from uh, Dostoevsky who said, if you really want to know a society, visit its prisons and then you'll really know the society. And then he it describes the awful conditions and he goes on to say, a society which contemplates this kind of practices um, with, with calm, calmly, is, is already fundamentally corrupted. 
And this society, the powers that be today, would have you believe that you're already there, that, you're, that they would have you look on calmly at this level of injustice. Um, but as we've been noticing, as we've been touring, doing this tour, it's, it's not the case. Um, there's a lot of people that are, that are ready to move, that want to do something, that are looking for the right thing. And uh, we hope that Maroon can help with this new book, help a lot of people answer that question. Um, so just to say a little bit more about myself and how I got involved in this, um, I'm involved with a group called Scientific Soul Sessions, which got some literature in back there, based out of New York. And um, through Fred Ho, the other editor of the book, um, had been following Maroon's writings for decades. And Maroon has been writing since uh, 94, the first essay in this book is. Um, but they were all really scattered all over the world, like little essays here, mostly anarchists had typed them up into little zines, but nobody would ever really put them together in one place. Luckily, Fred had somehow collected this archive of these writings, and he said, you know, maybe we should do a book, read through these, and I was blown away uh, by these writings. Um, and part of the, how I first went down the rabbit hole of Maroon is I also um, helped run an organization called Eco-Socialist Horizons. There's another thing in the back there. Um, talking about climate change and you know the capitalist sources of our, ec our ecological and economic problems. And I wrote some stuff that I, and I sent it to Maroon that through this group Eco-Socialist Horizons and the stuff he sent back it just, just blew my mind. It was kind of like that scene from The Matrix. In fact, he al he's always referencing The Matrix where you, you go down the rabbit hole you know, and you meet this guy who shows you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So I, I started corresponding with him, really blew my mind, and then I went and visited him about um, it's almost two months ago now. And just to sort of put a picture in your head, many of you may be very familiar already with you know, what this stuff looks like, but I certainly wasn't. I'd visited prisons before as part of when I was in college, but I'd never seen this le a control unit. I don't know if people know what a control unit is, but uh, it's a prison inside a prison, literally. And picture like your you know, science fiction movie or your action movie where they keep like the super villain in this like crazy prison. It's just like that. You like go, you go through two airlocks, right? Or they close the door behind you electronically. And then you walk through this tunnel. Um, so there's the outer prison walls and then there's a whole other row of barbed wire and everything. And then another facility inside that. And then in the visiting room, here's a 69 year old man, he's five foot six and they have him shackled at his wrists and at his uh, ankles, and then has them shackled to each other. Um, and then you're separated by bulletproof glass. This is a level of, uh, you know, it just sort of blows your mind. And even the guards are like apolo almost apologetic because they, I mean, not to romanticize being a guard, but just to, it's so ridiculous, you know, the conditions that this man is in. There's a growing movement against solitary confinement, so you maybe sort of start, have started to think about this. Um, but you know, if, if you haven't started to think about it, I mean, solitary confinement, anybody who's been in will tell you that it's torture. Um, there was an opinion piece in the New York Times recently which said there was this guy who was in for 25 years, and he said, I would rather they had killed me. You know, that's, that's the level. Um, it, I mean, as Teresa said, you know, some people uh, kill themselves within hours of being in solitary confinement. And it's testament to Maroon's uh, incredible strength of character and vision that he's not only stayed sane, but stayed uh, you know, more up to date on things uh, and you know, more physically together than some people I know on the outside. Um, and that's why he chose his title, Maroon the Implacable, um, because he's, you know, he's sort of known for this in the movement. This, is this, this old man has never given an inch. He's, he's just where he was. Um, but even while he's never given an inch, he's um, spanned in a, a remarkable spectrum of uh, evolution in his ideas. And this book is, is testament to that. And that's basically what I know the most about, so that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, and, it's, and it gets back to Teresa's presentation because it's not just about Maroon. There's not an autobiography. There is an autobiography coming out next year. But this is a book which, um, as Amiri Baraka, who's a, f a famous uh, poet, says, uh, this book is that very funky instruction manual on how to make revolution. Um, so this book is a collection of essays that it's really just that. It's um, in the vernacular, in the language of the streets, you know, written by hand in, in a prison. I, I transcribe some of these essays, you know, beautiful handwriting on legal pads. Um, it's, it's a book designed to serve imprisoned members of, of our communities and to give them the tools to understand their situation and to rise up against it. 
Um, there's basically five main things I'll address of things that are in this book, which are all very exciting, and uh, I think this is a it's historic work here. Um, the first is the prison system. Um, it's in the last few maybe last decade, people have become more and more familiar with this concept of the prison industrial complex. That's, people get that word now. But Maroon was writing about this stuff in the, in the early 90s. And it's not for him, it's obviously a racist system. There's no question about that. It's in the statistics. You don't even have to have a moral viewpoint. You just look at the statistics. It's obviously racist. But it's more than that. It's a, it's a capitalist, imperialist system. And, that, and you know, don't take my word for it, look it up in, in, in the book, because he breaks down how it's not just about Jim Crow, it's about how they've set this whole thing up through the drug war, through US federal immigration policy, through you know, population control mechanisms, and he breaks this down in very you know, uh, simple language. This book was written, because Maroon is a teacher, and and, and, and many, many prisoners will tell you this, and they'll say, you know, Maroon saved my life. A lot of people have said this. If it weren't for him, he stands there shouting. He actually had a, ha a heart, because they can't, he's in solitary. They can't, uh, you know, talk to each other. So he would just shout, spend all day shouting until he had a, a heart problem almost. Um, but they would literally, he would write these essays, you know, on, on the history of the movement and, you know, these, these instruction manuals, and he would fold them up, you know, as he called this fishing, for people who don't know, and you tear a bed sheet into strips, and you tie a little, uh, tie a little piece in the corner there, and you slide it under your door, so it goes around to the next uh, cell over. And that's how this book was written, and that, that, this is how he conducted these seminars. So for, uh, if there's any college professors in the audience or anything like this, it's a very impressive, like, damn, this guy really, you know, went the extra mile in terms of this stuff. Um, so I think that's the first part is his thoughts on the prison system, which I think are very original and written in the language, uh, which is a very accessible. You could give this book to any literate person um, if they're curious and want to work at it, and they could they could they could get a, a crash course in revolutionary politics. Um, I'm going to read you um, just to give you a taste of his prose, a part of a chapter called uh, "Message from a Death Camp," which was written in 1997. He says. There is a war going on in America. Normally we can't see it because our enemies have laid down a heavy smoke screen to maneuver behind. Our enemies have become so skilled at these maneuvers that at times they even tell us about this war. Yet even then their deception is working to put us to sleep, all the better to attack us. They call it a war on poverty, a war on crime, a war on drugs, or a war on childhood disease. And tomorrow they will make up another deceptive title to maneuver behind. Hide they must, because our enemies fear the day when we wake up to the fact that hidden in all this rhetoric is an impoverished spirit which is alienated from life, fearful of difference, greedy, and confused. I'm writing these words from a prison. Don't get bent out of shape about that because I'm actually freer than many of you. I'm no less community-minded, moral, or ethical. You see, everyone in prison ain't a bad guy. In fact, you can be put in prison for refusing to be a bad guy. That is, refusing to go along with the real bad guys, the greedy billionaires, lying politicians, visionless social workers. I have a warning that I need to relay to you. I have to let you know that you have to get up out of your bunkers and do something about it before it gets worse. I'm being housed in a death camp. I mean that literally. I'll leave you on a cliffhanger there. And just to, just to underscore what his death camp is, if people are maybe familiar with the name of Charles Granier, he was the guy who that was uh, put up um, for the abuses in Abu Ghraib, the prison in Iraq where they tortured those prisoner, prisoners in such an awful way. Before he was in Iraq, he was a prison guard at SCI Green, torturing Maroon and others. And this is ongoing. This is one bad guy, but there's a lot of bad guys, and it's ongoing. It's still in there. So that's sort of the first part of this book, which is, uh, uh, you know, a red pill. You know, take the red pill and go down the rabbit hole about the prison system. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is history, uh, the history that he tells of the black liberation movement um, from a, an insider, someone who founded the Black Unity Council, which was established two years before the Black Panther Party was formed in Oakland, um, which later merged with the Panther Party, and full of lessons from, you know, politics, to you know, personal lessons, to military strategy, all in one. Uh, different tactical, strategic lessons. Um, and also, you know, a voice that hasn't been heard on this. There's a, there's a pretty sizable handful of books um, written by insiders, but this is a new voice that has not been heard for a very long time, unless you've been in this small loop of people who've heard about it. Um, so I think that's another thing that, that, that makes this book unique. But his understanding of the black liberation movement did not begin, of course, in 1960. And that's where it gets into this word which you may be wondering about, maroon. 
So Maroon took on this name after he escaped, as Teresa mentioned twice, uh, from, from maximum security prisons, which is a heroic act in itself. And he not only escaped, but he, he, he was survived, or evaded a national search team of helicopters and vigilantes and police dogs for 27 days on his own. And he was reading Boy Scout manuals, you know, trying to figure out, figured out ways to evade. So this is a heroic thing which we should valorize, you know. And just to make sure we're very clear about this, that's not why they put him in the hole. He was put in the hole in the control unit because he was elected first black president of the Lifers Association, because he was a leader. And so it's a very clear-cut case of being a political prisoner for his ideas. Um, so what are the Maroons? Um, this is something that we don't know, a lot of people don't know in their history. I didn't really know as much until I started reading his stuff. There's a couple places in the U.S. you may have heard of that were maroon areas, the Great Dismal Swamp and the Carolinas, um, and then the Seminole Indians in, in Florida. And those are sort of the two things that people have heard about, but it was much bigger than this. And what Maroon did, obviously he couldn't do his own field research, but he read every book there is about Maroons. And he actually memorized these books too, because he can only have a few books at a time. That's one of the ways he stayed, stayed sane, is he memorized his whole books. Um, it's the level of intellect that he brings to the table. Um, but uh, it's, it's, this history is ubiquitous. Anywhere there were slaves, anywhere Africans were enslaved, there were maroon communities. And maroon communities, were, they were, maroons were the ones who ran away. They broke their chains, and they took up in the mountains, and they weren't just escaped slaves. They were American Indians and also poor indentured whites. You know, it's something that people don't usually talk about. In the history of the colonization of this continent, the first colony in Roanoke marooned themselves. They ran off and joined the, the natives. So there's a way in which maroon communities are not only something which we should recognize for their, you know, amazing historic uh, heroism, and not only was it just like a great moral thing to do to run away from slavery, but they militarily defeated the biggest imperialist armies on earth for hundreds of years. I mean, there's a couple cases people know about in Brazil, Palenque, for instance, repelled six invasions from the Portuguese, from the Dutch, from the English, um, and this was throughout the Americas. And, you know, as we all know, the people who win history, win the war, they write the history, and that's why we don't know these stories. But Maroon has brought it back to life for you. Um, so we have to, we have to bring these, we have to bring that back, back into the picture, this, this idea of these maroon communities as an example, as a, as a model for us to follow, to build a, a multiracial, multi-ethnic, uh, exodus from this capitalist, imperialist, patriarchal system. Um, so I think that that's something, you know, particularly to think about in the state of New York, upstate New York, which was, uh, you know, this was one of the hotbeds of the abolitionist movement. You know, John Brown up in Troy, is buried up in Troy. Um, you know, the, I, used, I remember I learned about the Underground Railroad in school, and you think, oh, yeah, I would have been part of that. No, no, no. These guys risked their lives, the people who started the Underground Railroad. These are people who lived here, you know? It being, this wasn't a joke, being part of the Underground Railroad. If they found you, you would get, it, they'd off you, you know? Um, and it's something we have to think about if we have a bigger prison system, more people in prison in this state than the whole country of Italy, which has the largest prison system in Italy, maybe we need another underground railroad. Um, and that's something to think about. And, uh, he, and he goes into that here in his chapter, The Real Resistance to Slavery in North America, where he suggests that we uh, take up the, the historic challenge. Um, the last two things I'm going to mention where Maroon has a very innovative, very cutting edge uh, perspective that hasn't been heard, especially from people, in, most of the people in his generation, are his thoughts about gender and about women. Um, and in this, he's very brutal about himself. He refers to himself as a former male supremacist, former patriarchal gangbanger, and he's pretty vicious about his former self. And that's how he grew up in West Philly in, as a, in a gang, gang scene. But then he talks about how when he joined, when he joined the movement, he just took all that baggage with him. And he thought that, well, you know, if I'm joining the movement now, I'm doing this for my love for the people, well, that includes women, so I don't really need to reevaluate my previous male chauvinism. And he tells that story in a way it hasn't been told by many people of his generation. 
Um, and it wasn't until he got into prison, you know, and he, he talks about, you know, I thought feminism was this bourgeois, like, white thing that they did up in the north somewhere. And that's, that doesn't have anything to do with my struggle, my people. But then uh, he started to read this stuff when he was in prison, and it transformed him. And he's moved rapidly from being a, a hardcore feminist to an eco-feminist to now he promotes matriarchy as the original communism. We have to return to, uh, to that conception. And you know, we can uh, have a Q&A about, I can tell you more about this, but I gotta get through all the amazing stuff in the book. Um, but I think that that's something that, um, it's, it's just a remarkable transformation. And uh, this book has been praised, for instance, Sylvia Federici, I don't know if folks have heard of her, she's a feminist scholar. She, you know, she says, this book is a document of transformation carried out against tremendous odds and told with searing honesty. Um, this, so it's this amazing, uh, and that's one of the things he'll first plug when I, when I went, met him. That's what he wants to talk about most of all sometimes. He's like, you know, we have to have women's liberation be front and center of anything that we're doing. And if that's, this is not, a, this is not something in the, that we do after the revolution, which is a lot, what a lot of the 20th century left said. is like, oh, well, we'll have the revolution and then we'll free women as part of that. You know, um, and he says, no, 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 matriarchy. Um, so there's another thing, which is another cutting edge idea, last thing I'll say about the book, is his thoughts about the environment. And this is most, the most recent thing. And you know, again, it's impressive that somebody who's in the most artificial, enclosed environment imaginable ever created on planet Earth, that he is very tuned in to what's happening ecologically. They put him in uh, one hour every five, one hour, five days a week, he gets into a concrete cage where he can see the sky. And he told me, he said, you know, even I can tell in here. It was hot yesterday and now it's freezing. Like, I've been here 17 years, I've never seen anything like this. So he's tuned in and he, you know, he gets some periodicals, he has some you know, TV, radio, depending on where he is at the time. And he sees, you know, we're in the middle of the biggest, one of the biggest mass extinctions, the sixth mass extinction in world history. This climate is changing. We're on the verge of not only major economic global collapse, but global ecological collapse. And we're seeing this in extreme weather events. We're seeing this in the 300 plus thousand people who die directly every year as a result of climate change. Um, so he, he's very tuned into this, and, but he's not, he's not content with environmentalism. He he's, he's promotes eco-socialism, which acknowledges the capitalist origins of ecological degradation. Um, and so I think, again, like this is another very much cutting-edge, far-seeing uh, insight that Maroon has put forward for us. Um, so that's, I could, we could say more about the book, but I'll leave it at that for now. And I want to um, say something a little more specifically about, as Teresa's invited everyone here to make a, take a stand. And um, what we're doing right now is, with this national tour, which began April 1st, is we are building a movement, not only to freedom maroon, but to take on this big, these bigger issues. And uh, this is happening through this organization, Scientific Soul Sessions, through this organization, Eco-Socialist Horizons, and, but Mary specifically also around Russell Maroon shows. There's more of these flyers in back there. So something very exciting happened last Thursday, um, which is that Maroon was transferred out of SCI Green. And he's been told every day for the last 20 years, you will never leave here. You'll always be here. And a week after the book came out, and a week after we got one of the largest law firms in the world, Reed Smith, to donate pro bono lawyers, they transferred him. So we don't know what's going on right now. As we speak, Maroon is actually in worse conditions than he was before. He's, in a, he's still in solitary, he's in a concrete room, doesn't have any of his possessions with him. However, he's in a lower security prison. He's out of the, the, the most high maximum security thing they can do in Pennsylvania. So this is a definite victory. It's a, it's a sketchy victory because we're not sure what's happening next, but there's no doubt that this is a response to the campaign that's been put together over the last year and a half, two years. And which is, of course, not to say that there hasn't been a campaign for Maroon's freedom. Teresa and her family have been, you know, on the front lines of this since he went in. Um, but in the last couple years in particular, I mean, another thing to say is that Maroon for many years refused to let there be a campaign around him. He said, until Mumia is off death row, don't work on me. Um, because he acknowledged that there was a greater need there. Which is very, you know, I, I don't know, <laughs> could you do that? I don't know, that's a rough, that's a tough question. And, um, but when, when Mumia as a major victory got moved off death row, uh, this campaign really ramped up. 
And uh, so I think that that's, so we want to invite you to, we, they threw us off with this, with this transfer. We didn't expect this. Um, so we printed out before this tour, we had organizing packets we were going to give to each one of you. Here's what you should do. We have a 30-day campaign we're doing from April 8th to May 10th. Um, and they threw us off because now it's a different cast of characters that we got to target. But the main thing I want to say to this evening is we don't have, there's a, there's a legal and political team that's reformulating a strategy right now. Um, but the thing I want to ask you to do is take a flyer and uh, there's a website at the bottom and I think it's going to be tomorrow morning they're going to post a new organizing packet. Um, so you can read that and what we're going to basically ask you to do is make a phone call and send a letter to Secretary Wetzel. Um, I won't go into the details because they might change. Teresa and I are going, we're touring 16 cities over the next month and in Pennsylvania Department of Corrections they're going to start getting phone calls from Ithaca, New York, from Woodstock, Vermont, from uh, Amherst, Massachusetts and they're going to be like, holy shit. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for being here and I just want to conclude by saying that um, for many years I did not do political prisoner work. I've been at doing an organizing activism for about 10 years now and we have a very schizophrenic culture in general and that bleeds into our activist culture and people pick their issue and they just work on that issue and they're like oh you got to pick your battles, you got to do this thing. Um, but we all have to make political prisoner work part of our work because how are we going to advocate for any kind of social justice if we don't take a stand for the people who were the leaders of the last round. You know, how are we going to liberate ourselves if we don't stand up for the liberators who are on the front lines? So Maroon educated me about that. I urge you to educate yourselves through Maroon's book and to make political prisoner work part of your work. Um, uh, but thanks so much for being here and stay in touch. <laughs>